Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, so uh, um, we have just a couple of announcements first. Uh, first of all, um, there are uh, internship information meetings for Washington Seminar and Utah State Legislature. Uh, one of them was this morning at 11. Huh? And the other one is tomorrow at noon. So if you're interested in uh, an internship meeting, uh, learning more about Washington Seminar, which is a really stupendous program. It's an opportunity for you to uh, go to Washington, D.C. and live at, for about the same price you would in Provo and, and work on, in some uh, capacity in Washington, political, non-political, international, domestic, whatever. Uh, it's a pretty amazing experience. Um, and then the other announcement, I'd just like to, that quote that uh, Allie gave us last week, she had made copies and forgot to distribute them, but uh, so I'd just like to distribute those. So I'm just going to pass around these two things. Okay, um, and the other thing is, uh, so your first paper is due next week in class, um, and uh, yeah, people are unaware of this. Um, okay, your first paper is due next week in class, and, w and these papers, we give you really a wide range, you know, we want this to be useful to you, we don't want these to be busy work or whatever. So we give you a wide range of possibilities and uh, uh, for you to explore things on your own. Um, and uh, you know, one of them is internships, another is interviews with people who maybe do your line of work. It's a great uh, excuse for you to say, hey, I need to interview you and, and learn more about what it is you do and so forth. Uh, now Kelly, uh, her, she will not be here next, next yeah, so her office hours are this Tuesday at the same, same time. So it's 2 o'clock between class, my office is on right across from the Social Sciences Conference Room. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 For those of you who are taking this as a class, I realize that not everyone here is. Okay. So, uh, wonderful. Are there any other quick issues that we need to... Okay, great. Uh, the other thing I will say is remember to take the quiz. I will finish it tomorrow morning and if you have a problem with it, I can. I know it's the last few weeks because we've been having kids so busy with the schedule. So just take the quiz, take it, and I'll make sure you have the old thing to get it in your file. Okay, excellent. All very good reminders. Okay, so today we're really pleased to have with us uh, some people to talk about the most practical of all questions, which is, uh, you know, how do I get into graduate school? Um, and uh, we have with us Christina Carlson, who is the pre-law advisor here at BYU, and Mackenzie Lawyer-Davies, who is the uh, career counselor for uh, social science majors uh, here at BYU. And they have... Uh, wonderful uh, experience and information to share with us, so let's welcome them here today with us. Thanks for coming. Of course. <laughs> okay, is this working? Yeah, I think it's working. Was it? Test? Oh. Test. Okay, so is that working? Yes, it is. Um, like Dr. Hawkins said, my name is Mackenzie Lawyer Davies, and I am the career counselor over the social science majors in University Career Services. And so Christina and I today wanted to make this more interactive. Um, not do a PowerPoint, just talk to you because I know you have real world questions that you want answered. But the the way we're gonna go about today is we're gonna talk about four things. First we're gonna talk about the GPA and then letters of recommendation followed by resumes and then statements of intent or statements of purpose, per personal statements, called different things in different schools. Um, but first I wanna talk about GPA. And 
I was looking up some information today, thinking about most of the time I get students who come into my office, they're looking for a job. That's, that's what I do most of the time, but then probably 25% of the time I get students in my office and they're looking to apply for graduate school. And the biggest question I always get is, you know, I have awesome letters of recommendation, I have awesome personal statement, I did really well on the GRE, the LSAT, the MCAT, but for some reason I'm not getting uh, interviews, I'm not getting called back, I'm not, I'm not hearing back. And so when we talk, when we talk, we, um, I ask a few questions and trying to dive into the whys, and oftentimes it's, oh, well, my GPA is a 2.8 or a 2.0. And so the biggest thing that we wanted to stress today is you're never going to complain about having a 4.0. You're never going to complain about having a high GPA. It's going to offer you more opportunities. And so some of the questions that we often get is, um, often get are, can I, you know, I have a 4.0, but I've been taking underwater basket weaving. Is that helpful? No, not really. Um, graduate schools will look at your GPA and they'll be able to see trends and that's the most important part. You're going to want to consider the coursework that you're taking and a couple of things uh, to consider are to, of course, obviously try your best. They're going to want to see um, that you are trying in your coursework, but also taking quality courses. Like I said, underwater basket weaving is not going to be helpful. You want to show that you are trying and that you're looking for difficult coursework, that you're trying to um, increase your skill set, as it were, and show that you are ready for graduate school because that's the point. They're looking for the upward trends. The other way you can kind of raise your GPA, but as I was talking to Christina, there are only so many credits you can take before you really can't increase your GPA. So make sure that you're taking classes that are going to be helpful, but the more classes you take, the more likely you are to be able to increase your GPA over time. Uh, also, you want to um, consider that when you are taking these classes, sometimes there are classes that you have to take that are prerequisites. Law, for example, doesn't have any prerequisites, but if you're looking at things like um, social work, those do have some prerequisites. So you want to make sure that you're looking at that because they will be looking at different GPAs. If you're looking for medical school, for example, they're going to be looking for those science GPAs and different coursework. So you have to consider that. So um, the one thing I wanted, the, this is the smallest aspect of it because GPA is kind of self-explanatory, but you want to make sure that you're show that it's an indicator of how well you can perform in graduate school because it's not all based on your GPA or not all based on the standardized tests you take. It's a combination and they're looking for low risk situations. They're looking for students who are going to excel in their program and then go out into the world and make a difference based on their graduate school. So keep that in mind. Thoughts? I will say today, I just received an email from a student who's applying to law school and he's worried about everything and he said to me, he's like, you know, if I take a bunch of one credit courses this semester really fast, can I hurry and improve my GPA? <laughs> I said, well, you, you could, maybe, but let's be honest, once you've hit, he's got about 110, 115 credits, how much is five credits of underwater basket weaving really going to help? improve that GPA and and they'll see it because they're gonna see your transcript so you know that's that's always kind of the thing that I say is you never regret doing well in school so do well in school right if only it were that easy <laughs> <laughs> um, the next thing we're gonna talk about are there any questions about GPA no it's self-explanatory oh go ahead oh wait It seems like some graduate schools look at different periods, like di like the last two years, or like all like or or way one heavier than the other. How common is that? Way like your major versus your all the rest of your stuff. You know, it really depends on the program you're applying for. For law schools in particular, they're always going to notice grade trends. I have lots of students who come into my office who tell me I had a rough freshman year, but since then. I've got this GPA, we'll submit an addendum and we'll do our best to kind of, in essence, highlight the fact that really maybe their GPA is a 3.4, but for the past 60 credits, they have a 3.9. You know, the law school still needs to go off of the overall calculated GPA, but that does certainly help kind of ease their mind that you're prepared for the rigors of their coursework. Um, but for other programs, it really kind of depends. That's a standard lawyer answer, but it depends. 
some programs, like if you're looking for something like sociology or international relations, it really depends on the program, especially schools. But for the most part, they're looking at the last 60 credits. And that goes for like the MPA program here is looking for the last 60 credits. But again, like Christina said, they're looking for trends. And so they'll look at everything, but they may only really calculate that last 60 credits. But again, you'll never re regret having a high GPA. So you want to make sure that you're focusing on the overall GPA. OK. that's. That's pretty much the only quantitative thing we're going to talk about today. Oh, is there another question? Yeah. Well, let's hear it. Um, my friend, when she was applying to grad school, she said that um, she only submitted like her major GPA and that they only really cared about the classes that were in your major. So if you do, I mean, mediocre in your GEs, but really excel in your major classes, is that OK? Absolutely. It, but again, it really kind of goes down to what type of program was she applying for? Um, some of those programs really are much more concerned about the coursework that relates to their program. Others want to see the overall student. So, um, so I guess if worse comes to worse and you have to choose which, what to study for if you're taking a GE or something in your major, focus on your major, but, but it's still going to be helpful to do well in all of them. Okay, so that's, that's kind of our quantitative discussion. And the other part that always goes along with grad school is the standardized test. Um, the only thing we have to say about that is do well on it, right? Again, if only it were that easy. But um, it's really easy. If you come into my office, you're going to see that we have lots of information when it comes to scores. And we do that because it's a service to the students. It's a service to you guys. But I'm always a little conflicted about it because scores are only one part of the application. Now, it's so much easier to compare using apples to apples. And quantitative scores like that, like what, what do you get on the LSAT? How do you do on your overall? What's your GPA? Those are things that are easy to compare across the board. But we're going to talk about the things that make you stand out. You know, I, I often say that those, the GPA and the standardized test are gatekeepers, but it's these other things that get you accepted. Okay, so we're going to talk about, first off, letters of recommendation. Um, I'd like to ask what you know about letters of recommendation, but I think everyone will say, well, it's written by a letter writer and they say good things about me. Um, the best thing I can tell you is that as you're thinking about letters of recommendation, you can never start too early thinking about it. Um, one thing I always kind of say is if you know in about a year from now you're going to be applying to graduate school, think about what professors you have who you would like to have write you a letter of recommendation. S if you think about it now, then a year from now when it comes time to ask for that letter of recommendation, all of a sudden you're not going to have to have an awkward conversation because you've worked for a whole year to make sure that you're ready for that. Okay? Um, so. What I want to encourage all of you to do is to, s is to study it out and to say, OK, who would I like to have write me some letters of recommendation when I'm applying to grad school? Who in my program? Maybe I've never even taken a class from this professor yet. Um, and then after you've identified it, I say this in the nicest way possible, start stalking them, OK? <laughs> you, <laughs> you may seem a I know. <laughs> Let me explain. <laughs> Okay, one of those things is start getting interested in what that professor is talking about. Go to their office hours, read the articles they've written. Um, I spoke with one student about that and he said, you know, I have a goal once a month to take a professor to dinner. He's like, I invite my other friends so it's not just me and the professor, so it's not awkward. <laughs> but he's like, I have found that I have been able to actually make some connections and been able to get to know someone much better. <laughs> yeah, that, that sounds pretty good. So, so that's, that's my first kind of thing is I want you to be thinking about it. I can't tell you how many times I have a student come into my office who's applying right now and it says, you know, my classes are big. I just don't know any of my professors. So who should I have write my letters? Okay. That is a difficult conversation to have because then I'm, s I'm sitting with the student trying to brainstorm about something that they probably should have done. Graduate schools really don't care if your classes are big. I know that's unfortunate, but that, that means that it's up to you to kind of figure out, okay, how can I make a relationship here? Um, 
I just brought this to show. Um, we do interviews with law school deans, and I was reading through this as I was preparing for this. Um, but, well, before I go into that, something to keep in mind is that for the most part, you're going to want professor letters of recommendation. Okay? Now, for law school in particular, um, they ask for two, at least two academic letters, which would be two professor letters, and then one professional letter. Okay? Um, now, when you, when you hear a professional letter, I have a lot of students who are like, I'm going to have my bishop write it. I'm going to have my mission president write it. I'm going to have a lawyer in my ward from home write it. Now, those are okay, but I'm going to tell you what one of the deans said about that when we asked him. He said, um, let's see, BYU students tend to get their bishop, mission coordinator, family friend, especially attorneys and people prominent in the community. We don't really pay much attention to those letters. Ouch. I kind of hate that because I think, oh, well then what are we supposed to do? Okay. Now, it's always better if they're asking for three letters of recommendation and you don't know who to ask besides your mission president, go ahead and ask them. They can choose whether or not they'll pay much attention to it. But as you're thinking about graduate school, because remember, we're advising in the dream world where you have plenty of time to prepare this golden application, think about it and say, okay, what's a professional letter of recommendation that I can get? And then start working backwards and saying, how can I make sure and get that? Um, any other, any questions about letters of recommendation? A boss. A boss, absolutely. Absolutely. Someone who's observed you in the work setting. And I know that's where we get a little tricky in the sense that a lot of times a mission is a work setting in a lot of ways. You have to really kind of work with the mission president if you're going to do that to make sure that it shows some work type qualities. Okay. Other questions about letters? Oh. Uh, there's a professor in my major who is. Uh, she's kind of famous for giving bad letters of recommendation. Uh, how do I, do, I, like, do I just ask her if she's going to give me a good one? Because you don't get to see the letters, right? <laughs> that is a great, that's a great question. Um, I'm going to show you. Now, here is, here is something that makes letters of recommendation difficult, is that when you're asking for a letter of recommendation, instead of just asking, would you be willing to write me a letter of recommendation? You say, would you be willing to write me a strong letter of recommendation? Now, this is where the conversation gets crucial. You know, we all sat in that crucial conversation where the stakes are high, emotions are too, I forget. The, anyway, <laughs> you need to ask them. Now, um, we encourage all students to provide them, we provide them with a dear, rec dear letter a recommendation writer letter where I say specifically um, if you're going to give them a poor recommendation be honest with the student and let them choose if they still would like you to write the letter now I know as a letter writer myself it's completely awkward for me to tell someone you know I'd probably write you a kind of junky letter of recommendation but I've also said in the past maybe you need to think of some other people before you come to me so, um, but if you know that they have a reputation for writing poor letters of recommendation, don't ask them. <laughs> just don't. We'll just find somebody else. Okay? Any other letter of, recommender, letter of recommendation questions? Okay. Um, I'm, I'm right now. Oh, wait. Wait for the mic. Let's just um, I'm in the middle of applying to law schools right now, <laughs> and I've noted that some law schools want you to submit, instead of a letter, an evaluation. Um, do you have any suggestions about who we would be asking to do that, and what's the best way to get them familiar with the evaluation specifically? Um, that's actually a great question. Um, what l how many of you are interested in applying to law school? Can I just see in a show of hands? That helps me. Okay. So LSAC, 
the law school admission council has come up with a new thing that's a letter or you can do an evaluation. Now, it's only in the second year of doing this, so it's still a little new, and word on the street, or word from law schools, is that they're not quite in love with the evaluations, but we've still got them, they're still around. What you need to do is I encourage you to go to the LSAC website and print off the evaluation questions, okay? Then look at those evaluation questions and say who would, write, who would be able to answer these the best? Some of those questions include, there's, there's five or six sections on it. Let me pull those up. Okay, so it's got intellectual skills, personal qualities, integrity and honesty, communication, task management, working with others, and then there's all sorts of questions that kind of follow behind that. My best recommendation for you is to really kind of look at those questions and figure out who's going to be able to say the best positive things about it for me. For evaluations, they're not interested if it's necessarily done by an academic or a professional person. They just want to see those answers. The other thing to keep in mind with evaluations is that there is a field where they can really pretty much upload their own letter in it. So an evaluation not only answers those questions, but provides an opportunity for them to say all these wonderful things about you. Okay? All right, so let's move on to resumes. Thank you. I actually wanted to kind of tie letters of recommendation into resumes and kind of tie the plug into the Washington Seminar Program because when I was an undergraduate here, I did the Washington Seminar Program and interned with the Office of Senator Bennett. The nice thing about that was I, was I was able to get a letter of recommendation for graduate school signed by Senator Bennett, which was awesome for my graduate school application. So uh, when we're talking about resumes, I'm going to pass these out. I want you to think about where your resume is now and where you will want it to be at when you graduate from um, your undergraduate and are going to apply for um, graduate school because that's something to keep in mind. And I'm going to steal one. So how many of you have updated your resume in the past two months? Okay, how about past month? This week? Okay, great, we have a few. I want to um, encourage you to keep your resume in mind always in terms of, if you look at the back of this page, if you don't have this kind of experience on there, how are you going to get it? How are you seeking it? What are you looking for? Are you actively trying to build your resume? Because as much as your GPA and letters of recommendation are important, it's also important to show graduate schools that you're not only focusing on your education, but you're trying to become well-rounded. And whether that's interning, whether that's working a part-time job or volunteering in the community, also including any mission experience on there, it's pretty important. And so I want you to keep this in mind. This handout is something that our center has put together on best practices of what employers and graduate schools are saying. Um, it's something that you'll probably use more in the workforce than you would in graduate school, but at the same time, they're going to ask for a resume and you want to make sure that yours is working and that it's strong and that it's helping you get into graduate school. So if you turn to the first page, in here, a couple of things that are common um, kind of misconceptions and misnomers that people think, well, how am I supposed to include my information in here and what sections should I have? And so things you have to include are what kind of graduate school are you applying for? What are they looking for? I had a student who came into my office and he was applying to a graduate school in international relations. So if you consider the sections, he's going to, of course, have education in there. But he was asking, well, should I put work experience? And I said, well, what are you considering? And he said, well, I'm looking, I, I'm thinking about potentially putting an in international experience and languages in there. Well, great. If it's working for you, if, if it's with purpose, consider it. You have to consider that your resume is a strategic tool that's going to help you get into graduate school and help you enter the workforce. One question, what is the point of a resume? Anyone? Yes. Stand out, great. To get you an interview, excellent. So whether it's graduate school or whether it's a job, and in graduate school it's your whole application, but the point of the resume is to not get the job or to get into graduate school, it's to get that interview to get you into the job or graduate school. So some of the things that you might consider are, you know, if you look at this insert page, people think that there's one right way to do a resume, there's not. 
It's very personal, it's very stylistic. You have to think strategically. Some of the things that, some of the concepts that are up for debate and that have been, they're not rules, they're guidelines, we've created guidelines for them, are something like limiting it to one page. Well, this is a resume. If you're creating a Vita, then it's different than a resume. Other things are an objective statement. Should I include an objective statement? Well, the question is, is it taking up valuable space that could be used to demonstrate what you've done in an internship or a volunteer experience? So you want to consider that. Another thing to consider is the format and the amount of space that you're using on your page. And you want to look between a 70 and 30% white space ratio. So text to white space ratio. If you look at the back of the actual handout, there are two examples. What are these? Examples, thank you. I have too many students. Oh, are there any more of these? Here you go. No, no, really, I haven't memorized. If you look at the back of, <laughs> I look at these every day, all day. Uh, if you look at the back, there are two samples there. They're just examples. Students have to realize that there's no template and that you have to work it for, for yourself. So that's one thing to consider. If you look at those examples, it's try I'm trying to teach you in very specific ways. If you were to read this, it gets the creative juices flowing on how you could list experience. How many of you work an on-campus job or have worked an on-campus job? Okay, great. Sometimes students come to me with custodial experience or maintenance experience or they scooped ice cream at the creamery. And they think, I just scooped ice cream. But they haven't thought about the baseline. Okay, so you started your first day and you realized that it was kind of a high pressure job. There's a lot of people waiting in line. You're trying to um, be as efficient and as quick as possible. If you really thought about the things that you do innately and naturally to make sure that you're doing a good job at the things you do, then you can think in terms of um, developed problem solving skills. Those are kinds of things. Uh, developing ability to deal with ambiguity. Um, those are some things to consider. So think outside the box and make sure that you're focusing on the outcomes and the accomplishments. You don't want to list your job description or your duties or the fact that you swept the floor. You want to tell me the skill set that you developed because I don't care that you swept the floor. I care that you developed a skill set that's going to be transferable to graduate school, to being uh, showing that trend of hard work. Um, and then how many of you have served a mission? Okay, great. How many of you have your mission on your resume? Good, if you don't, you should consider putting it there because it's extremely important. Leadership skills, communication skills, teaching skills, uh, you name it. If you look at this page right here, there's a bunch of examples of what you could include in mission. You also have to consider that the point of in including anything on your resume is to show that you're well-rounded, right? So if, for example, you list your mission, you wanna make sure that it's complementary to the other things that are on your resume. And for those who haven't served missions but are still serving in the church, the, um, there are opportunities, if you look right here, you can list other things that you've done as church service. The church is unique in the fact that a lot of, a lot of our time is spent fulfilling callings at church, and sometimes that's not understood outside of the church, but at the same time, if you list things in a, in a business type way, you can demonstrate the skill sets that you've developed. So for example, I taught Relief Society for about a year. That's something that I could include on my resume because I was planning, I was teaching, I was adapting. You wanna make sure that you're focusing on what you've done. So when you're building your resume and you're looking at kind of how to format it, the three things to consider are your heading at the top, what's, your, what's gonna be your branding mechanism? And then you have to consider the sections or the headings within it and what you're going to include. And then the most important part are the bullet points. You wanna start with strong action verbs, quantify whenever possible, and also qualify your experience. Tell me how, tell me um, who, I always ask the question, by dot, 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 what, dot, 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 you have to give me more. If you're looking at the spectrum of, of vague to very specific, you wanna be in the middle because you want to give them enough that they want to know more because that's what the interview is for. So can I steal this quickly? I gave you that handout, but I also gave you this handout. You wanna start your bullet points with strong action verbs, demonstrating the strong skill set that you have, and you wanna make sure that you're not repeating them. This is a, good op this is a great opportunity for you to describe the experience that you've had. You have your GPA, there's not much you can say about that. You have your test scores, there's not much you can say about that. But your resume and your personal statements are the two ways in which you can really shine. So you wanna keep that in mind. Um, are there any questions about resumes? Yes. 
the, the three kind of things to consider is your, your branding, which is the way you list your contact information and your name, the sections that you include, so education and uh, relevant experience or work experience or professional experience, volunteer experience. Um, consider how you list your information. And when you're listing um, the information in the bullet points, make sure you're consistent. So the bullet points are the, the next, or the third aspect. Other questions? Yes. Oh, sorry, do we need the yeah. mic? As far as GPA goes, um, is there a cutoff for what you recommend putting on the resume and keeping it off the resume? Like 3.5? Sure. Our office, or mm -hmm. our office recommends about a 3.5 and above, but it really depends. If, for example, you, let's just say investment banking firms. We saw, a, we heard of a student who had a 3.78 on her resume and someone told her to take it off because it was mediocre. It really depends. What do you feel comfortable with? If you feel comfortable with your resume or your GPA, even if it were a 3.0, but you have awesome experience and you say you scored a perfect a perfect score on the LSAT and you had a 3.0 they're not going to they're going to look at the trend over time and the differences between the two so um, think about it but 3.5 is is generally what our office kind of says i saw another hand yes mike um, with volunteer listing volunteer experiences and work experiences um, would you say that the differentiation the different Say right now, the differing point um, would be just being paid and not paid, or what would you say to differentiate those two? It's up to you. A lot of people include s uh, professional; they'll have professional experience or experience, and they'll include a mission under that. So they won't have volunteer experience. But when they do have volunteer experience, most of the time students aren't going to put uh, something paid under volunteer experience. That's usually unpaid. But that doesn't necessarily mean you have to have a specific volunteer experience section. Include it, however, is going to be most strategic and thought out and thoughtful for you. Yes. So if it's an unpaid internship, should we put it under professional or volunteer? It's up to you. But if it's professional experience, why not include it in your experience, your professional experience? If you are working on a skill set and developing relevant, um, a relevant skill set that's going to help you get into graduate school or help you get a job, then why not include it in the professional experience area? I also, by the way, brought my business card, and so I forgot to hand that around, but I'll give that to you. And Christina said she, she forgot hers, but if you sent me something. Oh. Never mind. Fancy. Um, if there are no more questions, then I will turn it over to Christina for personal statements. Great. Thank you. Um, just a couple of law school specific answers when it comes to resumes. Um, we had the dean of Harvard admissions here a couple of years ago, and he said, you know, when I'm looking at a law school applicant's resume, what I want to see is did they just go to school and play video games all day, or did they go to school and get involved in something? So. I always kind of take that and say, OK, look at it as kind of a timeline to showcase what else have you been doing. Um, additionally, one thing to keep in mind, the length of a resume for law school, you want to, well, let's see, length of a resume for other things, Mackenzie says. One page. <laughs> what, one, page. Try and keep it to one page. Try and keep it to one page. I definitely agree with that, unless for law school you have so many substantive experiences that you can't help yourself. Now, if you're concerned that you're not sure if it's a substantive experience, then it's probably not, okay? So work on keeping it to one page, but know that there is a little bit more flexibility provided that you're telling them something that isn't showcased anywhere else. Um, and then I always, I love seeing missions on resumes. I think it's really helpful for them to kind of understand what you've been doing, and especially as we're looking at it as a timeline. But I really caution you to make sure that you don't try and classify your mission as a complete service opportunity. I have a lot of students who want to make it seem as if they are doing service 24 hours a day when the missionaries lived at my house for quite a while and I know that they weren't doing service because they would have done my dishes for me. So, <laughs> so just make sure that it's shown and make sure that those skills that you learn on a mission are absolutely wonderful skills and own that. 
you know, being able to talk to strangers, being able to work and be able to explain beliefs is something that makes us really unique. So don't just kind of discount it and say, oh, I performed service by teaching English once a week or something like that. You know, kind of look at that skill set and look at those things that you've learned. Um, Okay. Oh, and I'm also, I also have to touch on GPA for law school on resumes, just kind of answering that. We typically recommend that unless it's a 375 or higher, don't put it on there because they're just going to be looking at what the LSAC transcript says anyway. You can put your BYU undergraduate GPA because oftentimes your BYU GPA is a little bit different than your LSAC calculated GPA. Um, you can put that to kind of show that there is a little bit of a, bit of a difference, but they always go off the LSAC, LSAC transcript anyway. Um, okay, so personal statements. So we're kind of filing into that. Personal statements are hard work, okay? All of a sudden, you guys stopped listening when you heard that probably because you're like, oh. They are. They're hard because they're personal. Um, a couple of things to keep in mind. Now, this is for all graduate schools as you're thinking about it. Look at the prompt carefully. For some graduate schools, they really want to know, why are you interested in our program? Why are you interested in social work? Why are you interested in international relations? Answer that. Answer that question. Um, for law school, however, it's a little bit different because the prompt is often a little bit more open-ended in a tell us about yourself. You're like, okay, where do I start with that? Um, keep in mind that with all personal statements or um, what else do you call them? Statements of intent, I guess, is that the goal of that, kind of similar to thinking about, okay, how do I strategically make my resume fit the goal? The goal of the personal statement is to have the admissions committee read that and say, I want to take this person to lunch. They sound so interesting. So make sure that you come across as interesting on paper, right? If only it were that simple. Now, like a resume, a personal statement is one of those things where there are lots of ways to do it wrong, and there's no right way to do it, okay? Um, I always say one of my favorite personal statements that I've ever read was about a student who was applying to law school and talked about learning to play the piano, okay? And he talks about kind of his evolution of it, and he said, you know, when I was 13, my parents had the, I had the, my parents had the rule that I had to practice 30 minutes a day so what did I do? I practiced in one-minute increments. Okay, what a stinker, right? <laughs> but um, but then he kind of he showed this evolution as he talked about some of his um, coursework and some of his other experiences. That now, as he goes to practice the piano, he finds that there's just not enough time in the day because he's enjoyed it so much. And he likened that to just kind of showing how he's learned how to work. He's learned how to work at some things that just don't always come easily. And that was his personal statement, okay? Um, it didn't necessarily say, look at all these big extravagant things I've done. Instead, it was just a nice snippet into an aspect of himself. Now, when you're thinking about the personal statement, the other thing to think about, and the reason why a personal statement is so difficult, is simply because it is difficult to talk about yourself. It's difficult to brag, let's face it, right? No one wants to brag. But the personal statement is the one time where you can just showcase yourself amazingly. Now, in our office, we have a personal statement editor that is designed to only edit your personal statements, which I, I think is wonderful. So I'm always going to say, come and use that, because it's great. She's trained to do just that. But imagine how much easier it is to edit something where they're boastful, and we can kind of tone it down as opposed to someone who you don't know, and it's so humble that you don't even know what they're talking about, okay? You can't say, oh, but Greg, remember when you did this? We can't say that, because we don't, we don't know you that well. So, so that's why I always say, you can start big, and we can tone it down, but if you start small, it's so hard for us to help you bring that up. Um, now, I have a couple of tips of how to get started on a personal statement. How many of you have ever written a personal statement before? Oh, great. So anything you guys want to share about it? Or was it hard? Yes. It looks like it worked, I guess, right? Um, 
here's here's kind of how I want you to be thinking about it. The first thing you have to do is you have to brainstorm what are some of my very best qualities, okay? Now, I encourage you to ask your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your, st your parents, your roommates, what are some of my best qualities? Now, don't tell them that it's for graduate school because otherwise they're going to say something cliche like remember when you negotiated a better curfew at prom okay you know I mean like they say something like that and you're just like really that's my best quality that I got to stay out till three in the morning that one time anyway okay so don't don't tell them that just say I'm working on an assignment for school what are some of my best qualities Okay. Now, you probably also have an idea of what, if, what are some of your best qualities, so don't discount that. Just make sure that you kind of have a list of as many best qualities as you can think of. And then, after you've created that list, start to brainstorm. Okay? I really encourage people, when they're working on their personal statement, to write it in chunks of time. Now, I have a lot of students who are like, it's Saturday, my application's due on Tuesday, I'm just going to pound it out today. I can tell you that that is a surefire way to have kind of a junky personal statement. So taking the time on it is what's really going to help kind of marinate it to be a reflection of yourself. Um, so take those qualities and then in 15 to 20 minute increments, start to kind of free write some of those experiences you've had where you've either learned to develop that quality or you've learned where you've kind of exemplified that quality. Okay. If you start writing out some of those experiences, you're going to find that some write much easier than others. Some things that you may think, oh, that's, that's a good idea, maybe just don't work out on paper. And after you've done that, then you can start to kind of find a theme progressing. So you're like, okay, you know, I can see how this is going to work. Then you take those stories and then you start polishing. You start polishing and polishing and polishing. And with keeping in mind the idea, okay, what am I being able to communicate that this is who I am? Now, I always say a personal statement can be two things. It could be a full body shot where you kind of show a bunch of different interesting stories about yourself, or it can be maybe just a head shot where you focus on just one, one or two things. But you want to be careful and make sure that it's not this landscape picture with you in the corner, okay? You want to make sure that you're focusing on yourself. I have a student right now who sent me her personal statement, and it's all about her grandma's memory of World War II. What's the problem with that personal statement? It's not about her at all. I think, great, if your grandma was applying to law school, I would let her in. <laughs> but she is not, so we have to figure out what it is that makes this interesting. Um, so that's kind of personal statements. Do you have questions about it? Everyone's ready to go, right? Oh, okay. I'll wait for the mic. Oh, what's the general length that they're looking for? Um, this is more for like not law school. <laughs> sure. Then most, most graduate schools that way have kind of a word requirement that they'll give you. So, and a lot of times they'll have quite a few questions. And they'll say 500 words, one to two pages, that kind of thing. For law schools, it's typically two to three pages double spaced. Okay. I just drew a blank and forgot my question. I've been thinking <laughs> about it the entire time. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm pregnant. How's that? <laughs> That's okay. You can think of it and ask me after. Sorry. <laughs> That's fine. It'll come back. Um, any other personal statement kind of issues? Um, well, a couple, I guess a couple of things to also think about when it comes to the personal statement is that we see in my office, we do pre-health and pre-med, that kind of thing, um, and also pre-law. So a lot of times students will come in with a personal statement that says something like, blood was gushing from my arm as I tried to kind of, um, oh, I forget the terms. Anyway. <laughs> so, a personal statement does not need to be something cliche where it just grabs you. If it's well written, it's going to be fantastic because it's going to keep that reader engaged. So, don't, don't fall for kind of the cliche written stories. Instead, make sure that you're focusing on, on you. 
you know, because y- you are not a cliche. Will your personal statement editor edit personal statements for other grad schools as Absolutely. long as we bring in the prompt and the requirements? Absolutely. If you bring in the prompt, she's fantastic. It's when you don't bring in the prompt that she's going to really just focus on the grammar of it. But if you bring in the prompt, it's wonderful. And there's not a lot of variation when it comes to it. A well-written personal statement or statement of intent is well-written for any program that you're applying for. How worried should we be about like the way it sounds professionally? I mean, it's a personal statement, so we want it to be our voice, but we don't want it to sound like we're just telling a story and chewing bubble gum, right? <laughs> it should be friendly. I, I like to think about it that way. It should be friendly. The goal of it, like I said, is for them to get to know you, uh, particularly for law schools. They don't do interviews. So this is kind of your entry into saying, hey, I'm fantastic. So you want to definitely keep your voice, which is one of the reasons why I think an editor is so helpful to help you keep your voice and yet guides you through it. Um, but you also want to make sure that you're not instructing them. I have a lot of students who want to kind of show off big quotes and things that they've learned. And instead, I just want them to focus on themselves. So keep it, keep it friendly, not too casual, but also not formal. Okay. Any other questions about that? Great. Any other questions in general for me or Mackenzie? I know it's two minutes to f- 4.50, so. Oh, great. Uh, I'm just wondering what the best way to get one or either one of your ear for 20 minutes to kind of bounce some of our ideas off your mind. Um, is it just by email? Um, I have, I am pretty religious about my office hours. I work really hard to keep them. It's Monday through Friday, 10 to 11 a.m. And I would say I'm probably 96% always there during that time. And I'm fairly flexible. I meet with students about 20 hours a week, but you can either call or email. And I, we have some student employees who manage our schedules and we can um, have them contact you. Great. Well, I've really enjoyed speaking with you and... I'm sure Mackenzie has as well. But. Yes, but I did want to give a plug. I don't know. I know you're looking for graduate school, but at the same time, I manage the university wide career fair, and so I have flyers for you. Um. <laughs> and if. Absolutely. It's a great opportunity, even if you're not looking to dress up and kind of get your jitters out. It's a great way to network, to see what it's like. And if you're interested, we have um, a bunch of federal agencies who are coming. We have businesses who are coming. We have nonprofits who are coming. Um, So it's I think it's just a great opportunity, even if you're not looking to kind of come and network. So and on the back, it has information. We are having an open a whole day of resume critiques on the 26th the day before. So for graduate school or for the career fair, come and we can uh, look over your resume. Yes, <laughs> that was just the next thing to tell you about. Um, we have a law fair coming on October 19th. That's a Wednesday. That again, I always say, if you're not even interested in law school, it's a great practice opportunity to kind of get used to that. And then we have the Um, grad fair coming up on Monday, October 24th, okay? So, and we'll be posting, registration's still ongoing, but we'll be posting the grad schools that are coming um, probably by the end of this month. We'll have that up. The law fair's October 19th and the grad fair's October 24th. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Thank you.